Welcome. This is a March 6 OpenCFS production user call. We have Dan, Andrew, Stu, Jan, Greg, Rob, John, and myself, Michael. And Rob, you kindly chimed in with some observations on the idea of whiteout support in OpenZFS. What did you learn? Uh, so, um, I had, yes, I had a look at, uh, so whiteouts just being, well, my understanding of them is if you build some kind of like overlay or union file system and you delete a file from, uh, the top, you don't really want to delete it from underneath, but you want the file system to believe that it, uh, or sorry, the view of the files to be that the thing is gone. Right. Um, and so this is done by putting a little kind of magical stub marker or tombstone or something um, in the in the top layer called a whiteout. Um, so it's just a magical file that the VFS knows that when it sees, it should not show it, but it should just return not found and not continue looking and all the rest of it. So um, I just wrote a little bit there about just the mechanisms on the two file systems. The ZFS for Linux has had support since 2.2. Uh, um, has had support for whiteout files within within the, uh, right? an ov an overlay union. Yes. So if, okay. if OpenZFS is the top layer, so the the in the Linux kernel, this is um this is overlayFS, and so if you set um a ZFS directory as the what it calls the upper directory, mm -hmm. um, that, that will work, and the white uh, whiteouts will be handled sensibly there. So um, I tested that last night, and it works well. Uh, these are just the, the, the PRs that saw it merged. Um, and there's a lot of history there, but uh, if you read through it, there's some stuff in there like the Zill needed support uh, for it. So if your file system crashes while while it's running, we replay the whiteouts correctly and things like that. So it got a bit, it got a bit fiddly. Um, but that works well. Um, I, mean, I did a five-minute test, but I assume from that, and mine worked, and I assume from the fact that it's merged, it means it does work. So uh, that's fine. Uh, on FreeBSD, FreeBSD has a different mechanism for whiteouts. Linux uh, creates a whiteout by creating a character device with major, minor, zero, zero, and an extended attribute. Uh, hmm. So they just kind of hacked it into sort of something that you will never see on a real file system, whereas FreeBSD has a real uh, whiteout flag and a real uh, VFS operation for creating the block whiteout. And that is not currently supported by um, OpenZFS. No. In a couple of the comments in those PRs, there is a little bit of speculation about how one would implement that. And it looks very straightforward, um, just no one has done it yet. Um, and that is the extent of my knowledge. I think I heard you on there about to say something. He's probably going to tell me um, that I've done the, right, the wrong kind of whiteout or something. <laughs> mm, <laughs> no. You know him well. I love it. So oh, he yeah. has, um, for efficiency reasons, um, to not break the abstractions, you want basically the lookup key under which you find the whiteout to be the same as the path you want to whiteout. So you can't use anything with like a dot wh dot file name or something in the directory to write, uh, write out the name, for example, like it is done in the OCI uh, tar image specification, because then you would have to split the p path to look up in the name cache on elements and so on, so that you can't look up a path as one string. And um, what previous does is uh, normally it, when you are told how Unix works as a user, you are told that on Unix files are uh, everything and every file is just the back of bytes. And there are no file types unlike macOS, especially classic macOS, but that's not really true. It's just that there are file types, but the file types are only for the operating system. And there are the file types like directory, normal file, and so on. And where you have or named pipe, and a whiteout is just a new file type in UFS. And what happens when you have the union mount point is you have a stack of file systems to search through for the name. And normally you stop on the first hit. Uh, and when you the first hit uh, finds um, 
right out, it just aborts the search, but doesn't return anything, basically, or it returns the placeholder. So it doesn't search uh, in the lower stack levels because it finds the stop the search marker further up. So the problem is that the FreeBSD union file system is a well-known kernel panic generator. Just have a look at the Mount Union FS uh, man page, which hasn't really been less scary since its introduction in FreeBSD 5, because no, nobody really wants to uh, touch this part, because uh, from the mailing list threads I've read over the years, and I can't give a good single message to reference, it's that it breaks so many of the assumptions or kind of breaks the assumptions in the VFS, because normally the idea is that you have the VFS on top of the normal file system, but now you have VFS wrapping VFS. So that now things which normally don't reference themselves suddenly can form cycles and stuff like this, or what used to be a tree is now, now an acyclic graph. So uh, you suddenly have new reference counting problems. And yeah, it is what it is. Would those um, problems extend to Z yeah. ZFS? Or is the, it a UFS issue? ZFS is not part of the problem. It's really, it's even UFS has a problem. Mm -hmm. well, that's clear. Uh, I have never used, but read about it, uh, that yeah. UFS can support union mounting with other UFS and it's supposed to have worked in earlier days uh, quite nicely because uh, then it's with, basically you have one UFS, which is then, and the union stuff is handled within the UFS layer, not within the VFS layer. So it's inside the file system where maybe these problems are easier to fix or to avoid if you design with it from the beginning. So the question is, does, and what I'm seeing here in the PRs is, is the, what used to be absent from ZFS is a way to even encode on the disk that this directory entry is a write out for a path and not anything else. And they, uh, there's not one PR if you want to, uh, be scared away from union FS, the read the main page. Do you have the PR handy? For what? Oh, the union FS issues. You mentioned a PR unless I misheard you. Uh, I mentioned the main page. Okay. FS looking. Well, so oh. I think I think that was my question. I I was trying to find out because I don't I'm Still knew enough to FreeBSD that I didn't know this issue. So I did read the man page and saw all the scary things in it and wondered if I was in the right place because the ask had been made about uh, whiteouts. So um, I was wondering if I was actually looking for the right thing. Uh, um, like, unfortunately, have, yes. So you have the union <laughs> FS uh, driver, which can union mount potentially arbitrary <laughs> VFS file systems. And then you have the mount union option for the UFS file system. And that's the thing I haven't tried because by the time I got interested in it, I was no longer using UFS. Mm. And that's the fuse file system you okay, found. Okay, that's there. not it. So then is no, this no, uh, not it? I... No, it's not. Okay. This is the um, union FS kernel uh, documentation. Okay. What I mentioned meant is the mount union fs mount oh, underscore okay. union fs command thank you that's ah, okay uh, that that now scroll down to bugs and you will ask yourself if you ever want to try that on anything but a <laughs> machine example and bugs okay hmm. and i've played around with it in 13.2 and with in a the first attempt works, the second attempt works. And, and then when I tried to do other operations, I could identify which exact operation, but with my jail experiments, I within minutes I had a reproducible uh, kernel panic generator. I see. 
<laughs> it would just reboot the box with a panic with some assertion in the VFS triggered. Alrighty then. Uh, uh, so I guess just for we slow people, does that mean such issues would trickle up into ZFS or it's a maybe no, not so I, much? I'm right. pretty sure that this, this stuff is FreeBSD side stuff. If union yes. driver is incomplete um, or, or buggy or whatever. Um, if it's from what things from things I read, there's a I don't have the link with me right now, um, mm -hmm. but there is a on LWN there was a comparison from one of the Linux developers when they were putting together some of the union work that was sort of just surveying the different operating systems and what options were there and like Unif UnionFS on FreeBSD was sort of mentioned in the same breath as overlay on Linux so. And from what I've read conceptually, they seem to be the same thing. So it is. ZFS could could implement the pieces needed for Union to work. But if Union is buggy, then it's going to blow up. Um, and that's a FreeBSD um, side uh, exactly. work. But, it, but if there's another way that this stuff is done in FreeBSD, uh, that... that um, like like build building up layered file systems or or, or whatever um that may be a different oh. mechanism that I don't know about but I I couldn't find about that um yes yeah the traditional uh BSD UFS layer from Kirk has the option to only among UFS file system to union mount without the union FS as far as I can tell and it happens underneath the VFS. So that UFS right. reports as one file system, and the union operations happens within the UFS layer underneath the virtual file system layer. So it's a hmm. file system which does its own overlaying stuff, and the generic overlays, which were at the time, for example, intended so that you could use an ISO image uh, or a DVD or whatever is you lower level and then have a live system on top of that, which feels writable with a big memory disk or something. Right. So, so that you could have the it... union across file system types. So right. and, uh, and presumably UDF that's... and UFS. Or... And so that's UFS calling back into the VFS. So it's essentially acting as its own sort of mini VFS that knows how to dispatch VFS calls. Uh, I understood. Or is... I, yeah. as I, said, I just grabbed through the code. Uh, if I understand it correctly, it happens underneath and the VFS, uh, VFS doesn't get to learn that this is a stacked file system within it because it's done in, in the way the, the inodes are accessed within mm. the UFS. So cool. it's at the inode, not at the vnode level. That sounds, to me, that sounds clever, and it sounds like a response to the fact that UNIFS doesn't work properly. It's um, like, well, no, we're going to do something so well. Oh, it's older than UNIFS. Wow. Okay. <laughs> uh, All right. So, really. The code had commits from the 90s uh, when I used git blame as in lines which still show up. Mm. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Interesting. Uh, the other part is, it's yes. not. It doesn't sound like this union FS is unfixable in FreeBSD. It's just that nobody had the motivation to go and clean this up because it's not really usable. It as if for production, and it is useful for some corner cases. It mostly, as far as what I found, works as long as the underlay file system is read only. But if you have writable file systems stacked with each other, then you get into a quick panic territory. Uh, uh, but if you could either identify which cases are working and enough of them work, for example, with ZFS, it wouldn't be a problem if you had to pick a read-only file system or a snapshot as the all but the lowest uh, all but the uppermost layer, maybe, oh. so that you could basically pick a bunch of snapshots you want to uh, 
put into union, then put your uh, mutable data as the top level, which would probably uh, match 99% of the container use cases that the mutable stuff is at the top of the stack. Would that be uh, persistent or would it vanish on unmount? No, no, if... the, the data would be persistent and all where? of the corruptions, what? Where? Yeah, that, that's, that, that's where? That's where you make an open ZFS or whatever file system, uh, a persistent file system, the top layer. So yeah, okay. the, mod the, the modifications are saved there. Um, if if you made that a RAM disk, then it would be yeah, lost fair enough. on amount. So yeah, um, I do this yeah. in in Linux all the time in my development environments. I make uh, mutable VMs that I throw away. Yeah, totally. Okay, that's all. Hmm. Jan. So if you a good example where you would want to have a maybe a pre-populated file system, but want to have the changes be inferior, so destroyed with container destruction, would be something like var one. You want the directories with their ownership to be pre-created so that your non root uh, daemon in a container or jail can write its pit file there. So you have, let's say, uh, a piece of software written in Go, which does not start as root, so it cannot mm -hmm. create its own directory in var run to write its pit file into. So you have to have a directory, an empty one. But you don't want to save a pit file across reboots of uh, because it's mm -hmm. meaningless after reboot. Um, or if you have some kind of auto-generated configuration, it could also be interesting to just yes, something may want to, for example, be able you want to be able to mess with it, but it's not supposed to be a pad. It's supposed to be a reproducible container, but you still, for debugging purposes, want to be able to take a container out of rotation and then say, now I want to manually add it with this, this configuration and see what happens. And if I restart, I want it to come up in the clean, correct configuration again. So there are use cases where you would want to put a temp FS as the topmost layer. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but that would be intentional that you want to discard not lose, but intentionally discard the data on unmount. Um, so that should be a supported kit. But if all the lower levels all had to be, um, so if you basically, if the code, for example, would stop you from uh, adding a new layer if one of the existing layers is writable, then maybe that's what catch most of the bugs. Uh, but if there's now that this becomes relevant, that adopting the OCI configure, uh, container specifications, for example, uh, maybe it's just that someone has to, who understands the VFS, has to be basically paid a bit of um, uh, money for the therapist. Um, New lever or whatever it takes to get them to uh, dig through the code, understand the problem, and fix it because it's probably fixable. And not. Uh, that said, uh, users, what use cases do you have? Or are we just academically scratching a non existent itch and having well, a day? I can so describe this production. One use at a time. Case. Uh, Rob, uh, go ahead, develop some stuff. If I could just. if I. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, weird, but <laughs> um, no, I was going to say, in terms of use cases, um, like everything that Jan described is stuff that is possible in like Linux's overlay FS. So, like, it has ID mapping and uh, so sort of all, all sorts of bits and pieces. However, I and I don't know the answer to this, I don't know how much of the way it's sort of put together is uh, related to the way you kind of construct isolation things in Linux. Like, you know, um, instead of having jails, it has, you know, like uh, namespaces for different resource types that you then combine into this thing called a container. Like you usually have to do a lot of work underneath with like, um, you know, bind mounts and uh, mount point pivots and this sort of thing. And it's not, it's not onerous, but it's very Linuxy. So when I when we think about use cases in FreeBSD, 
I'd be wanting to say, well, what are the isolation primitives we have there and how do how would you want to express some of these concepts that way? Like, do you have, do you do something like when you run a jail, the, uh, like, like if you, br- you know, because a, a jail to my understanding is, is kind of the unit of isolation. If you like, nothing can go in and out unless it's specifically been brought in and out. What does that mean for, you know, like a file system crossing that boundary what uh, and and are there other opportunities that i don't know the answer to any of this i don't even know if the question is well formed um because the easy answer is like yeah just upgrade unifs to uh, add all the features that overall ifs has but maybe that's not actually the way you'd want to work so but yeah i may have just complicated it with no good answers but anyway are there any users present who have a use case and would say oh that would be awesome if we could do this one single thing that's missing now yes do tell so that's why i looked into what i can do because what i'm doing in production right now is the easy but inefficient uh, solution which is just ignore the whole problem every jail gets its own deep copy of everything. Okay. So Including your nifty is, read-only clone mounts and stuff? The research I'm doing so that I can around. get out of that. Awesome. Okay. What I'm doing right now is that every time I basically I have a, J, a ZFS file system, it contains a fresh user land. I yeah. take a snapshot for, of each patch level of that. And when I want to create a new jail, I just do a local send receive and get a deep copy. Okay. So every jail keeps its own copy of everything. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, that's inefficient. Yep. But it's easy to manage. Yep. As in, there are no dependencies at the ZFS level because every jail can be basically one data set for all the operating system and software and one or more data sets for the application state. Uh, uh, quick be that you, some kind of VARDB Postgres or something. Yeah? Quick question. Has anyone seen a bit of documentation in any form of like, okay, here's the file system tree. Here's the stuff you must care about being writable. Here's the stuff that's always disposable. Here's the stuff that needs to be brought between machines. Here's the stuff that can't be on you know must be unique to a given machine is there anything like that or is it just trial and error over the decades so we have a freebsd uh, file system layout man page yeah okay uh, it see. could be better but it is there it just maybe it has to be extended a bit but it tells you what belongs where does it the the higher man page or file system? Let's yes. See. Yeah, and does it mention jails like okay in jailed environments this this and this matter this, no, this, this can be read only blah blah okay so just uh, a lot of it, the here, thing that is, would be nice very much can be read only if you don't want to change it yeah that's the thing is it's not that the operating system can decide that for you it depends on your use case. Are some things you wanted read only for others you wanted writable? Are some yeah. things you may even want to be have it re, basically reset on every restart so that yep. you get a clean environment each time? If you spin up a jail as a package builder in a CI CD pipeline, you want it to always start with this is my clean state. Yep. No, get and... the latest source code, compile, save the artifacts. And Try again. You never want to share anything which could potentially make it so that you carry state across runs. Exactly. And we, uh, we, we learned that some from the manual page, some from experience, some from you name it. So exactly. uh, maybe the three of us should just but, you know, shut up and listen to the others. I, I'd love to hear. Sure. You know, uh, John, anyone uh, else? Um, yeah, especially those on FreeBSD environments. Sorry to be a bit FreeBSD, but you have features yeah. over in Linux land that we don't have, and we want them. The thing is, what I found in uh, FreeBSD is that the way the file system hierarchy works out is that 
you I haven't really found a common use case where you have to write out individual files uh, or maybe share or write out, multi write out multiple things out of a directory. Instead, what I found is that they basically only want to put the right file system tree together at a directory level. Mm -hmm. Because there are the directory structure is expressive enough that I mostly want to assemble subtrees and not merge them. So because at most they create a mount an empty mount point directory and then mount something in them. You no longer have to do a lot. The one thing where it would be, uh, you would run into this is uh, in slash etc or slash user local etc. But there, if you don't want to have the burden to maintain your configuration across uh, releases mm -hmm. so that you now have to do the normal update or upgrade uh, steps for each jail uh, every time it's an update, Instead, um, I've, I'm toying around with the idea of basically applying the intended modification to the default configuration on every jail start because it's so fast that you don't lose anything. And it has the advantage that you basically create a tempfs pre-populated from the underlay. And we're talking about two megabytes per jail. Mm -hmm. It's, it's <clears throat> a joke from the memory consumption and under slash etc there shouldn't be any big files so i don't foresee a big problem if you limit it to 128 megabytes it's like a 60 uh four times uh growth uh, potential yeah. for you run into resource limits and the nice thing is that now you don't have to ever worry about pre uh, preserving your local changes uh, when updating the lower levels in your union stack because you don't you just have your intended basically the patch and you apply it on each startup and because of, it's not like a diff and a patch apply but it's uh run sysrc to set these settings and then it's done or copy these two files in or something simple like that um and for me that in my lab system worked very well and completely sidestepped the issue of nullfs uh, or so nullfs works but it only is a way what linux calls a bind mount yeah. previously it's not a special command but uh, or a special fact but a special file system uh, yes sc.local.sh is uh, yeah here's That's my ugly nice. hack to do that <laughs> it's like well uh, what if you idempotently, even though sysrc is not idempotent, it's like, oh, let's change it even if it doesn't need to be changed, but um, still. Wait, um, uh, there's some ideas for you. Uh, sysrc can be idempotent if your configuration is only configuration. Fair enough. Uh, anyway. And it's even easier if you, on the, what I do is I discard the tempfs uh, when anything fails on the next try to start it up, so yeah. I don't if I fail, I don't unmount it immediately so that I can debug it. Mm -hmm. But the next time the jail attempts to start, it will first unmount all file systems under its file system uh, prefix, so its uh, root path. And then I unmount those in the right order so that I can unmount them. Oh. <laughs> and that's like for five lines of shell to do that. But the problem is that, yes, the mechanism is there, but okay. it can't be up to everyone to go on this journey of discovery. We're off the path on open ZFS itself, yeah. such that, hey, users, do you have use cases to chime in that we've hopefully so reminded you maybe of in this let's conversation? Let's get back to the ZFS issue. Exactly. Without a union FS, what you have to do is, if you have a bunch of uh, layered OCI uh, container images as tables, what you have to do with something like XC is, you uh, untar a tarball, you apply the right outs. You untar a tarball, you apply right outs. If you have uh, several images uh, layered on top of each other, if anyone changes in the state, everyone on top of that and the step itself has to be recreated. So you would 
let's say you have a new FreeBSD patch coming out the, a few days ago, patch level five for FreeBSD 14.0. Yeah. Now, every jail based on this FreeBSD major release would have to be re-imaged. So you would take the new FreeBSD release, unpack the tarball, and then you would put the packages on top and the configuration on top, maybe another level of packages and configuration. And then you have, that's all recreated. And now you have your immutable part rebuilt, but you can't have it intermingling with persistent data. You kind of can with, with clever use of NullFS by making sure that only the NullFS mount points get redirected. Now that you can have uh, NullFS for um, files, files um, but the problem is that that doesn't break the normal atomic rename because for an atomic rename, you have to create a file and then atomically rename it within a file system. If you have a single file mount, it doesn't share a file system. So you can't do the atomic rename. I see. Uh, okay. Which is, for example, a problem if you want to use sysrc on slash etcrc.conf uh, because it will try to write a new dot rc.conf dot some random suffix and then atomically rename it. But because now it would have to cross file system boundaries. It can't do an atomic rename and it fails. Hmm. Goodness. Um, yeah, you could come up with clever solutions for that with symlinks and LFS, but it's not nice uh, and it would be visible to the user. Um, which is also one of the things solved by using the tempfs and instead by having a persistent set of patches uh, to apply. Uh, and I kind of have to say that I like the workflow, mm -hmm. but um, the problem is that oh, yeah, it's a one-off experiment and it's not the common way to do it. We have the problem that you're now alone and have to do it all yourself. Mm. It's open source. If you break it, you get to keep the pieces. Keep those, yes. um, and a, Reliable union of us would allow you to less efficiently, maybe, but you could basically do all of this um, layering dynamically at runtime so you don't have to pre create it. And where there's a problem to pre create them is the first startup time. When you want to have a good user experience for someone saying, I want to have this, let's say the equivalent of a, a Docker file mm -hmm. uh, or a Docker compose file. And uh, basically you have a de description. I want to have my database here, my cache here, my web server here, my fast GI server here. Bam, and I want it all up in less than five seconds. Yeah. Uh, and that's a problem when you have to move uh, gigabytes and tens of thousands of files around. Um, because there's, you can only, per, maybe you pay a fixed cost per uh, VFS operation, mm, no matter okay. how fast your uh, storage is. It doesn't matter if you're creating an empty file or a file you uh, to write 10 gigabytes and it's still creating a file. Mm. Um, so just some things just scale with the number of files and not the size of the content being referenced. Mm. Okay. A pathological example would be backing up an, an IMAP server using MailDeer with millions of emails. So if every email is a message, uh, as a file, you have a very simple data structure in the file system, but you also have backup times uh, going into uh, the tens of hours in a big sure. mail server, so that like half the day is spent on the daily Backup because you have so many file names to enumerate through. If only there were a file system that could perform miraculous operations below the POSIX level. Anyway. Yes. Rob, does this help? <laughs> have we but, um, <laughs> clarified this or made it worse? Um, uh, to me, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, yeah, there's more support. I, I, like, I don't know, but more support in 
FreeBSD wanted for actually constructing layers without having to jump through hoops. Hmm. ZFS may or may not have something to do with that, but uh, I mean, it's a real use case, but I would need to think a lot more. It's not really my uh, uh, area as such. But, my uh, hope here is that it's cool. It could, could get people to care about this issue and then solve it once uh, for all. Because well, my impression solved is... Solved in ZFS looking... or solved in UnionFS? Or both? Um, ZFS only has to solve it in as far as that it has to, per... has to have a way basically to let the virtual file system store whiteout files. So what has been done for Linux looks like they took uh, basically a shortcut uh, inside of ZFS so that they had to only do the minimal amount of on-disk format changes to save a write-out under the name to be matched against uh, because they basically took reserved values and gave them a new meaning instead of adding a new file type. Uh, but yeah, that probably works. And if it doesn't have any unacceptable hidden costs, then that's good enough. And it should be kept that way just so that we have a compatible uh, on-disk format. Right. It is a precedent either way. I mean, there it is. You gave us the links in the exactly. above. Exactly. And so, now yeah. what FreeBSD needs so that we can experience all the joys and pains of UnionFS as it is, is oh, uh, in the FreeBSD uh, specific VFS code to just report it as a write out uh, vnode and mm. uh, say that, yes, this is a supported feature. And um, that's what's uh, missing right now. So uh, that's a very legit approach politically to say, hey, we have this functionality in OpenZFS on Linux. Shall this be explored on other supported platforms? What's missing is the glue to report to the FreeBSD VFS that VFS is now capable of handling whiteout files. It's, oh, okay. It's really just the glue connecting the FreeBSD VFS. It doesn't magically fix whatever bugs are there in the union FS, uh, either by design or just by implementation. Yeah, that um, just that that piece in ZFS is like a relatively easy uh, 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 task in the in the in the grand scheme of things. Um, you know, if we, uh, I could have a look at it at some point, um, but. Yeah, it's and, still kind of unusable if if UnionFS is just going to blow up in your face, but at least then we can clearly point it like, right, well, now we have to fix the next, you know, yeah. knock down the, the next thing domino. Is, so. As I said, I haven't really tried to use UnionFS in anger in a long time. The Go last time it. I tried was years ago, and it yeah. blew up in my face, <laughs> and I just stopped the experiment there, and it looks like others have done the same but none of them felt motivated and capable of fixing it. But what does work is to just have a writable file system on top of a read-only file system. Hmm. Yep. Reportedly right. for lots of people over the years. And that's the use case we mostly care about for containers because you want to have the immutable base operating system packages and so on. And on then you want to combine that. So let's say you have the these 100 packages you need for your big web application. You uh, have your base operating system. You want to turn that into union. And then you want to take your uh, data file systems and you want to put that in the right place. And you then want the union FS to dynamically build the union mm -hmm. so that it, you can just use it without having to flatten out this uh, tree into a single uh, data set where you have to recreate the lower level. So. Cool. Here's, I guess. Where... Let's, I, I think we've <sighs> certainly, what... hopefully answered your questions, Rob. 
and I appreciate you looking into this. Here's where I think uh, ZFS well, please, takes this and makes it less likely to be worked on. If you're working on a purely ZFS system and you want that immutable kind of base layer and then put things on top of it, that's what a clone is for. You just... No. It does work purely. If for purely that, yes, a clone will work fine. No. Yes. It will not. It is death by a thousand cuts. It's digging your, digging a hole as deep as you can before the walls collapse on top of you. Goodness. Because what happens Spicy. is that you dig a hole. Let's say you, you do it now. You deploy 40 instances of FreeBSD 14.0 and everything is great. And yeah, now a patch level comes out. Okay, 10 megabytes here for each jail of unique data. Now FreeBSD 14.1 comes out. Every file is changed. You still have an origin you depend on. You can't get rid of it. But every you cannot update it. So you cannot rebase a clone. Every mm. modification within it has to be discarded. And the you can't take your changes you made to a writable clone and move them over to a clone from a newer version of the base operating system. You cannot mm. preserve this. You're locked into that. And now you have to carry your local copy of the changes and the reference to the shared old state and your local data. Potentially, if you chuck yourself in both feet and put data and code in the same file hmm. system, now you have it all in one and you pay all the overhead and get none of the but, benefits anymore. But for any, for any of the things that are going to change that commonly, you shouldn't be updating with, you, you shouldn't be mixing other stuff in with it anyway in, in something like a union FS. That should, that should be being kept completely separate. Yes. And if you're and not that... if you're not doing that, then that's just a bad layout. No, uh, you, with the union FS, yes, but with the union FS, you have the un lower level, so you would have the clone, which is kept with only hopefully of your base operating system. Within that, you maybe create a few directories, and then you have your u uh, slash etc, for example, and then you build a union of uh, the base system slash GTCs and you and every time you change a file, it gets copied to the upper level, the writable level, on the, and then written there. So the first time you change anything in slash etcrc.com, for example, whatever the lower levels brought in gets copied into the upper level. And for tiny configuration files, that's great. Um, hmm. Yeah. But, I have um, indeed wondered, should, I guess it would be impractical, but should Etsy slash RC dot D be its own data set simply so that's handled separately, but it might not even mount up correctly and boot um, up just because of baggage from decades ago. Or um, container workloads on FreeBSD, you have better options. This is true. Um, because, uh, while well, lastly, underutilized, you have a vendor path and that's perfect for a jail management solution to plug into uh what have so um hmm, interesting well i'm glad we're fleshing this out because we've all bumped into these issues in some way uh and of course as a container uh no problem you can mount whatever the heck you want wherever you want so there is this path and uh it's always included if it exists. Hmm. Oh, okay. Vendor.com. Oh, do tell. Is that covered by its own manual page? It's covered by the RC system documentation. Okay, cool. And it is uh, documented as, among others, in the code, but also somewhere in the main pages. Uh, hmm. So um, basically, if you have the etc default uh, rc.conf, for example, um, and then you have this, and with nullfs in 13.2 and newer, you can just create an empty file uh, in 
etcrc.de, uh, sorry, etcrc.conf.de name of the package or one of the names because you can look up multiple ones. For example, a bunch of the networking related ones don't just look up the global ones and the one under their name, but also the one under the name just network so that you can have one file for all the network related configuration. Hmm. Um, so that you don't have to duplicate things which are relevant to multiple uh, network related RC.d scripts. Um, but for, uh, for example, JMangit would make sense to put anything in etc default rc.conf and because that's a shell script and not just a passive configuration, you mm. could put in their code to look under a different directory for entries. Basically slurp sure. anything in that directory, just do a for a loop star dot conf in this directory and do a dot this path for everyone. Just Yep. Slump it into the current uh, shell. Okay, uh, we're deep in back in the jail call. So yeah, <laughs> and so zones. so anyway, um, uh, yeah, Rob, I hope that helps. Others, what you got? Have we? Uh, do you have something to sympathize with here, or are we just off in the weeds? And this is not ZFS's problem. John, you often have good uh, insight from your deployments. Uh, Stage wisdom. Will anything of that be relevant to you, what you would like to do, but can't, or? You're muted, but you might be busy. This, yep. this conversation is reminding me of a gentleman that used to be online many years ago, and I cannot remember his name. His first name was Terry. Um. And sadly, I don't think it's going to go away until we pull it all out and do it again. But hmm. I, I'm not going to disagree with death by a thousand cuts either. I do object to death by a thousand cuts. That's why I'm looking. To I'm not arguing. I'm not arguing. <laughs> I'm not arguing with you. But just to reiterate, it's my hope that if there is basically mind share behind the idea that it's worth to finally make FreeBSD Union FS a production grade feature and not a hack we haven't thrown out of a base tree, um, then yeah, that would be really useful. But it takes someone willing to do the work and it can motivation alone won't get you there because you're digging so deep in the guts of the kernel in a piece of grown multi-threaded kernel code john are you talking uh terry lambert and his comments on fixing union fs or maybe terry burnaby barnaby no, Lambert. That was it. You're welcome. Let's, I'm trying to load this up. It's uh, in his uh, home directory, tilde terry at people.bbsd.org, but I'm clicking and nothing's happening. I mean, the, the reality is if there's any part of a kernel that's a minefield, yeah, yeah. there needs to be work on that. Oh, you most people and your stability and stuff. Jeez. Uh, we've got our minefields too. You do? Oh, do tell. Oh, please. I, uh, I, gossip. Uh -huh. No, I'm not gossiping right now. Oh, I'm just saying we're not perfect. We don't, okay. I don't, I don't claim we are. Okay, cool. Uh, I wish my browser would let me click a link, but hey, I, I ask a link. Uh, people dot previous email. Other, other observations. I'm going to try to get this in there because if if it's a conversation from when was this long ago? Uh, Terry probably knows what he's talking about. Let's see. Boom. Please load. And that's uh, just did I misspell that. Terry. Okay. But it looks uh, really not a, there's usually not a slash between the tilde and the name. Correct. Uh let me try that again. I'm, yeah, multitasking here. You are correct. 
Otherwise, you may end sure, up sure, in sure, sure, uh, sure. www's home here. <laughs> oh, there we go. Yay. Um, <clears throat> Guide to fixing FreeBSD. Oh, the, 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 the patches. And when it comes to the UnionFS patches, it's not <laughs> linked. Psych. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, anything else? Anything completely categorically unrelated to UDNFS? Oh, I found and an old. Uh, yes. <clears throat> oh, that's not. Um, no, it's not that. I just found a mailing list uh, archives from 2003. Hmm about union fs and problems uh, hmm. but okay it's well no longer relevant i know ed mast was sort of vocalizing the challenges there and why do we have manual pages that are scaring people and sometimes they were like not even correctly doing so anymore blah 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 so ah, any Challenges at work that need a second set of eyes or six or so. Reg, Stu, John, Dan, picking on all of you. Which means your systems are flawless, running swimmingly, and these calls are now obsolete. Huh. You're funny. Mission accomplished. Famous last words. John, any? I was, I'm just trying to keep this on topic. This is a ZFS meeting. I mean, we could talk about be a be, be, be a beehive. But... You mean you've got lib NFS patches? You've had a moment. You put on a pot of coffee. No, but I had a conversation with people I can't name that talked about beehive not being able to do uh, uh, dynamic device uh, insertion and deletion. Storage or network? Excuse me. Storage devices or network devices? In this specific case, it would be a GPU. If, okay, yeah, fine. Show no, off. I just... Okay, um, yeah. Um, it doesn't support that. Um, but I would absolutely love to have it work with uh, network devices, for instance, because... Okay. That would allow me to run a, um, a, a a VM and then insert a uh, insert a a, a vert IO tap device yep. and then convert to the tap device and delete the physical device and prep it for eventual migration when we get that working correctly. So, Jan, per your chat, I was hinting at the storage devices with my question, because we do have that, and Jan put a lot of good work into that. But, okay, briefly, uh, ZFS folks, let's shift gears if you don't have a question. We will touch on this. You're welcome to drop off without any guilt. Um, do we have any mechanisms that we've overlooked that might allow that? Because Jan found the Vertio SCSI, and it was like, hey, we've got a pluggable SCSI bus for storage. Do we have any mechanisms like thinking out loud, USB hot plug ability or some craziness that we could leverage for other mm -hmm. types of devices? Go. What we could do uh, are the following stuff. So for networking uh, within the performance regime of what the tap backend can do. So it may be possible we have a net graph uh, subsystem to basically have it just pre-create a bunch of net graph sockets. Uh, which are the net, uh, net devices. And the interesting part is that the net graph sockets, you can pre-create and they don't tie up more than a few hundred bytes of uh, kernel memory a piece. So it doesn't hurt to pre-create it also per VM. And then you can reconfigure net graph at runtime. So the only downside is that the guest always sees uh, a virtual NIC with link state down. But you could arbitrarily reattach it to different bridges or other stuff uh, without having to mess with the normal um, 
host network stack because it would all be all happen with a net graph. And I'll throw out Kind there, of. my servers often have like a four port NIC, one, of, one port of which I'm using. So I will not lose sleep over that specific point. Thank you very much. Um, but that's only if you're basically playing at one gig networking. Uh, Right. as soon as you have 10 gig networking or better, the uh, existing do everything once per packet uh, implementation just won't scale. Uh, you have to do something like VPP where you do a vectored implementation. Yep. Did you say PPP as in the thing we used VPP, to use? vector VPP? packet process. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Uh, or what NetMap in theory enables but isn't used like that because right now the NetMap uh, support in Beehive FreeBSD it kind of works, I played around with it but it's not that much better than the other options uh, because it doesn't utilize the performance potential of NetMap to do a vector packet processing approach um, instead It goes through the normal path. And then uh, I was so happy when I found out that it used a um, vector IO model only to find out, yeah, that's the vector of the fragments of a single packet uh, instead of a uh, vector of packets. So great, I now can split uh, off the uh, ethernet and IP header and the payload, which, Mm. okay, it's useful, but uh, with this representation, but what I can't do is send exchange a, a batch of packets and process them in batches right okay because that's not the the just the basically the function pointer table in the defining a network backend is defined around per packet processing and not okay per batch processing john would a bunch of sort of unplugged scuzzy and network devices be in any way helpful that magically have backing things when the time comes. Is that a baby step forward? I am trying to understand I'm not sure. Okay, yeah, that's a perfectly legit answer. Um, But the idea is if we can't bring in devices like as PCI devices dynamically, well, what if there are a bunch of slots to use and they, in some cases, while uh, granted a GPU is a rather dramatic, you know, device. <laughs> I get that. But for storage and networking, maybe there are, you know, opportunities like Ian is out laying, outlining. Um, none of the ideas I described are... Um... PCI pass-through devices. All of Right. this is power, uh, power Yep. virtualized um, with the advantages and downsides that brings with it. Um, where it would kind of blur the boundaries is if we had a mode for the NVMe VIT.io uh, backend to show up as a zero-sized SSD if you don't want to attach a file and then As soon as you attach a file, it basically resizes the SSD from zero. So you would kind of create, start it with, let's say, dev null as backing storage. Because you can't read anything from it. It has, it has zero length and all writes are discarded. So it's safe to give someone write access to dev null, potentially. Uh, It just doesn't do anything but discard the data, which is what you want. And Mm then if you had just the option to uh, send Beehive a new backing file descriptor for this disk, which it would then start, resize the disk to that and uh, use it from then on. And that would be a great way to maybe change the storage for the NVMe backend, which would be probably useful for uh, Windows guests. I confess Because I've not tried to pass in a dev null device as a uh, I don't know if that I don't know. works. Challenge accepted. Um, um, I, I think the code will prevent you and will only let you share 
uh, wait, it lets you share the vaults which are character devices like DevNull. So it has to allow character devices. The only question then is what happens with this file size reporting? So yeah. Interesting. It may even work, but it would be uh, just a placeholder so that you can put something in the configuration field which won't hurt you. And yeah. then do a runtime reconfiguration, send the via the IPC socket still hidden hidden away behind the snapshotting support. You could then you send an NV list say, hey, this NVMe instance in this uh, PCI slot, please change the backing file descriptor. Is that what Rob Wing was working on a year or two ago? Of I don't know updatable sockety stuff. Hmm. Um, there's hmm. so many useful things you could do once you have a Unix socket for IPC instead of just signals. I see. You could even wait, have wait, it. Fuse if... FS. We could we could have a few. No, no, sure. Um... Oh, that was. Uh, <laughs> so what we have already is a server for that IO nine PFS. Yeah. Uh, but there is a put more complex but potentially faster design called VIDIO VIDFS. Yes, yeah. to VID. Yeah. And that's basically using the uh, VIDIO ring buffers to speak the um, Fuse protocol instead of the 9P protocol. So oh, what happens is that the hypervisor is basically also a Fuse server and the existing kernel uh, fuse implementation can then use to just, okay, the kernel understands how to use a fuse file system. So instead of using a character device, uh, like you normally would with def fuse index to uh, speak to a user space fuse server, the hypervisor is your fuse server. Hmm. And there's an optional the optimization device? on top of that. Uh, you can also use Fuse, uh, because Fuse already supports that, to have shared memory mappings so that you can potentially use nmap uh, through the hypervisor to nmap a host file into shared memory. Uh, yeah, just like you could do it with user space processes on the host. Mm. Huh. Okay. Uh... I can't imagine there are performance limitations to a fuse for IO contraption, but. Um, yes and no, it's potentially better than 9P. No getting. Okay. Fascinating. You're already crossing uh, what is supposed to be a security boundary <laughs> uh, between guest and hypervisor. Hmm. So there has to be some kind of serialization. There you have it, John. Sorry, it's not a GPU. Far from it, GPUs are very special devices, especially on well, uh, I, I, anything I, I PC related. Think we might be talking at two different levels. Um, yes, we are. I am. I mean, if if you have a if you have a SCSI uh, bus on your system, be, because you have an adapter that has a SCSI bus, whatever, um, and I insert a, a device onto that SCSI bus, that's, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. But I am basically saying what happens when I dynamically add a PCI device yeah. to Beehive. Exactly. Yep. Um, what I mentioned with that SCSI only applies to SCSI devices, so effectively yeah. block storage. Yep. Oh, no None question. of that helps you with networking unless you do perverted ideas from the 90s and try to do attach uh, Ethernet NIC via SCSI. Which, yeah, uh, has oh, been gosh, done yes, yes. kind of mm. works for 10 megabits on some obscure laptops, like an old power book with a Motorola 68K CPU. But that's just a crock, not a, anything anyone should aim to bring back from oblivion. Yeah. So, John, um, 
I confess I've never like needed to hot swap a GPU on a piece of hardware, even though I suppose I can with this nifty eGPU case and Thunderbolt FireWire USB 4, whatever the heck they call it. But what is it that's preventing a, a reboot insofar as I can't do it on real hardware? So what's unique in your virtualized environment? And you're muted, so maybe you're yelling at me. Sorry. I, you, <laughs> you asked a couple things there, and I'm trying to make sure I understand I can, them. I can't hot swap a GPU on hard real hardware. Why would I need it in a VM, and what use case so badly so requires that? We're talking about dynamically adding and removing a GPU resource okay. from a VM. Yeah, okay. Sure, shared rendering farms. That is correct. Something like that. <laughs> that, um, that their mind went immediately to. So. Got it. Okay. And as um, as a counterpoint to you, you can't do it with real hardware. In theory, you most assuredly can. PCIe is technically hot pluggable. That is correct. It exactly is exactly technical. Yeah. I'm going to watch you do it first before I try my machine. Just <laughs> you know, not not sure um, I recommend it, but. It's I can go buy a PCI card that has a bridge on it. I can remote to an external PCI bus okay, lock. Cool, cool. Um, there's there's all kinds of things we can do that we typically don't. Mm. Um, um, it's mm, quite but, common to do on laptops these days with uh, the better docking stations of Thunderbolt 3 and up uh, that you have actual PCI devices on that. Uh, so macOS and Windows support it. Some Linux distributions kind of support it. Um, maybe even kind of support it well, but um, FreeBSD doesn't um, because uh, the last time someone really looked at hot plugging devices, we were talking about, oh, PC card is 32 bits instead of PCMCA with 16 bits. And so that's where the rock stopped kind of. Back then, it worked for very old laptops with PCMC mm. AI cards, but um, and it will become relevant with um, NVMe over Fabric because um, it's quite likely we are going to get something which looks and feels like a PCIe bridge to access storage. Um, so if we were sitting on Linux KVM, this would work great with a Linux guest. It's all supported. Have a nice day. And the other part is that some big enough GPUs and funnily enough, uh, Intel onboard GPUs can be dynamically partitioned so that you can, for example, spin up a render job, which gets part of one of your big GPUs. This is true. Completion and then you spin up the next VM. Um, the big downside is the moment you do PCI pass through, you lose live migration for all intents and purposes, unless you have a PCI Express fabric where you can migrate and reattach, which I have only read in, about in marketing slides about hmm. potential future features and nobody claiming to use it. Okay. Um, Are we I, recording? Uh, no, but we can stop. <laughs> we are. Don't say anything wrong. But anyway, so I, I get the use case. And just to my question, is this working great on Linux KVM or VMware? And we are clearly lacking that feature. I, I sent you an example for adding a drive. Okay, so that's this um, above. So boom, there you go. Okay, and what about the GPU the that we, part, we led um, with? So the adding the drive part, if you're willing to attach your drive to a completely virtual SCSI bus, which is not attached to any real physical HPA via password or anything, it's purely a virtual SCSI bus where the same kernel is both target and initiator. Uh, then that works really well in FreeBSD. So that use that thing you 
shared as an example, you can do today with Beehive and VidIO SCSI if your guest operating system supports VidIO SCSI, which Linux and FreeBSD and OpenBSD and with the right drivers, also Windows support. Okay. So the and GPU. The UEFI boot one can boot from it. Hmm. So you can use this as your boot device with the FreeBSD UEFI boot one. Okay. So the GPU example for Linux, QEMU, KVM. But. So. Anyway, uh, I'm 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 looking for some information. Sure. Sorry. Okay. No worries at all. Yeah. Oh no, that's cool. I no. Uh, other thoughts while he's doing that. Dan, I can't keep you quiet. Rob, thank you for your patience. Uh, Greg. Good to see you. I hope you're doing great. <laughs> and thanks for that link to Liquid. Great domain name. That said, how about I call the official meeting at 15 after? I'm happy to stick around and if you've got some more spice to share. May the spice flow. Thank you, everyone. Like and subscribe. Catch you perhaps tomorrow for the Beehive Call.